All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Maker. I'm the Environmental Program Manager for the City of Carpentria. And first of all, thank you for making time this evening to come to our um, kickoff meeting for our Dune and Shoreline Management Project. Uh, this project started when the city initiated a general plan and local coastal land use plan update in 2016. I'll be referring to that as the general plan update. Included in that was a detailed sea level rise vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. Um, and the city contracted with Wood Consulting Firm to conduct this work, which included extensive public outreach and interagency coordination. As part of the vulnerability assessment, which was completed in 2019, vulnerabilities to city infrastructure were evaluated and as well as resources, uh, as well as the potential for future damages associated with coastal hazards, such as coastal flooding, erosion, severe storm events, um, all of which could be exacerbated by sea level rise. Um, and existing coastal resilience models like Cosmos were used to complete this work. And our team will go a little more in depth in that through our, our presentation. So the plan identified adaptation and resiliency strategies that are being used to inform the update to the general plan, which is currently ongoing. It's currently in the administrative draft phase and under internal review. A public draft is expected to be released soon. Um, updates incorporate current state and local requirements, including sea level rise and sustainability. And it includes two new elements, the coastal resiliency element and the healthy community element. To date, Wood, on behalf of the city, has conducted nine public workshops and 22 meetings for the general plan update. So the city was awarded uh, adaptation planning grants from California Coastal Commission and the California Department of Transportation commonly referred to as Caltrans, to move forward with a more in-depth analysis and understanding of how sea level rise will impact Carpentria, as well as develop adaptation strategies that can be integrated into the general plan update. Um, the city also applied for and received funding to create a dune and shoreline management plan, which included developing several options for a living shoreline. And the dune and shoreline management plan is one of the adaptation strategies that was identified under the vulnerability assessment that was completed in 2019. Um, I'm going to go ahead and Marie, can you go to the next slide, please? I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce this, today's agenda. We're going to just go through the team introductions, the background, project overview, Living Shoreline Basics timeline, and then we have allotted some time at the end for Q&A. Like I said, uh, if you could, please put your questions in the chat box and we'll be keeping track of them. Um, if you do have a question at the end that is not addressed and you'd like to speak to it, please use the raise your hand function and we will get to you as we can. And if, again, if we can't get to everybody due to a lot of questions and limited time, then we will follow up with you individually afterwards. Um, next slide. All right, so I introduced myself, Erin Maker. I'm the Environmental Program Manager for the City of Carpentria. I run our Sustainability Division. Uh, with us, part of our team is Erica Leachman, Principal Planner with Wood, and Marie Lau, also a Planner and Grant Program Manager with Wood. Chris Webb, who's the Coastal Engineering Project Manager with Moffat and Nickel. Connor Austin, Assistant Project Manager and Coastal Analyst with Moffat and Nickel. And Dave Hubbard, Dune Designer and Restoration Ecologist with Coastal Restoration Consultants. They're going to be presenting tonight. Also on our team is Matt James, Dune Designer and Restoration Ecologist with Coastal Restoration Consultants. He couldn't make it this evening. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Marie. Marie, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Can everybody hear me now? And see me? Yes. Great. So, um, as Aaron mentioned, the city went through the sea level rise, went through and created a sea level rise vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. Um, 
as part of that analysis, the sea level rise vulnerability assessment looks at projections um, using five feet as a reasonable worst case scenario. It could be worse or not as worse. The probabilities vary, um, which is why we the approach was taken to do five feet in that analysis. Um, the areas that are highly vulnerable to sea level rise and erosion are, and flooding are in low lying areas along the shoreline and throughout the city. Damages could severely impact residences, local business area owners, um, lo the local economy, local transportation and regional transportation, as well as cause a loss of important coastal access and recreation resources. So some of the key sea level rise vulnerabilities in Carpinteria are here. These are just to list a few. Um, it's important to note that these vulnerabilities don't just result from coastal hazards, but it's a combination of coastal hazards with fluvial hazards associated with flooding. And this map here from the sea level rise vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan um, shows the coastal hazard zones. Now this doesn't account for existing shoreline protection structures like the revetments and the dunes that are in place along Carpentry shoreline. However, you can start to get an idea of how the coastal hazard zones creep inland over time and impact low lying areas the most. Um, as a direct result of this of the sea level rise vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan, the city is exploring various ways to address shoreline protection. And today we're going to talk about the specific tools that the city is looking at to address these longer term issues. So we see that in Carpinteria, there are different ways that the shoreline is currently being protected. Um, in Carpinteria up coast, there's a rock revetment protecting the residences and down coast, there's vegetated dunes protecting the state parks property. However, the city beach shoreline in between those areas is unprotected for a majority of the year. There is the winter beach burn program, which I'll get to in a minute, but currently there's no permanent protection solutions in place um, over the long term. And this is important because directly landward of the city beach area is residential areas and downtown commercial areas that are highly vulnerable to coastal hazards and sea level rise, as I mentioned earlier. So I think this is a good time to say that it's an important reminder that the high vulnerability is due to a low, the fact that the city beach shoreline is a low lying area um, due to blockages of natural sediment flow from two different points, I, I guess. Um, there's a blockage of natural sediment flow going from upstream to downstream in terms of sediment that would naturally come from the San Ynez Mountains and the foothills, as well as from up coast to down coast, where sediment would naturally be migrating to the city beach area from Carpentria Salt Marsh. One temporary protection measure to compensate for the sediment flow blockage is the winter storm berm program. That is the winter storm berm is constructed each year in November and typically taken down in March, depending on storm predictions and beach conditions. Um, there's also county flood controls routine and emergency maintenance activities where sediment is deposited on the beach and pushed into the surf zone. Uh, that sediment and debris material is then worked by wave action and some of it is redistributed on the upper beach, which acts as a form of nourishment, um, but it isn't originally intended for beach nourishment. For example, this photo shows the recent clearing of the Santa Monica debris ba basin at Ash Avenue. And I think this photo is from February. So now that we know a little bit about the current setting and existing shoreline protection measures in place. Uh, let's talk about planning efforts in Carpinteria uh, for future shoreline protection. As Aaron summarized at the beginning of the presentation, the city just did a sea level rise vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan and is currently going through updating the general plan and coastal land use plan. 
Um, there's the two programs that I just discussed on the previous slide, the Winter Storm Program and County Flood Control. Um, and I would like to mention that this project is a direct implementation measure of the sea level rise vulnerability assessment, as well as it's identified as a near term project in the general plan update. Um, the Dune and Shoreline Management Plan, which is bolded here on this slide, will be a direct result of this project with conceptual living shoreline design as a focal point. Which brings us to the goals and key drivers of the project. Um, the primary focus of this project is to address protection of vulnerable areas and important city resources, as well as achieving long term benefits to public health and recreation, the local economy and natural ecosystems along Carpinteria's coast. Um, we also want to involve this also this process also involves a variety of opportunities for stakeholders and community members to get involved such as this workshop and uh, we also want to pay particular attention to identifying possible funding sources for ongoing maintenance of the living shoreline once it's constructed so you might be wondering what exactly is going to be covered in the dune and shoreline management plan well here's what we envision um, going into that plan specifically we want to look at different living shoreline alternatives. We know that there are living shorelines or similar projects going on locally or in the Carpentria region, as well as along the entire California coast. So we want to be able to reference those projects and put together our, our own toolbox of solutions in addressing how we want to um, approach a living shoreline design in the city beach, the Carpentria city beach frontage. We're going to in, look at a constraints and feasibility analysis in terms of the different shoreline designs as well as a cost benefit analysis and ultimately develop a conceptual living shoreline design with a longer term plan for regional management the and when we say longer term plan for regional management there's there's two benefits here um, to doing this living shoreline project number one is that we're planning for a living shoreline that will the design will directly feed into final design and permitting to keep the momentum of the project moving forward. As well as number two, there's added value of looking at cohesive shoreline management planning along Carpentria's entire coast. So that brings us to our two project phases. Phase one is focusing on the city beach frontage and designing a living shoreline for that area. And then phase two is looking at the longer term shoreline management for the Carpentria region which as of right now, what we're envisioning is from Carpentria Salt Marsh to Tar Pits Park. And here's, here is a visual representation of what we envision the approximate boundaries that the phases will cover. And now I will kick it off to Connor, who will tell us a little bit more about the basic concepts of living shorelines and shoreline protection techniques. All right. Thanks, Marie. Hi, everybody. My name is Connor Austin. I'm with Moffat and Nickel. I'm a coastal scientist, and I'll talk to you about the uh, coastal protection fe features and living shorelines. And when you look at all the vulnerabilities um, potentially in Carpinteria, you immediately start to think of shoreline protection techniques. This picture here shows a wide spectrum of what techniques can be uh, applied along the coastline to protect development and protect beaches and protect habitat. On the very right hand side are gray or hard structures such as bulkheads or the revetment at sandy land right now and on the left hand side are more soft or softer materials vegetation based shoreline protection features um, that are considered living shorelines and in between is a hybrid use of both hard soft materials uh, to protect your shoreline can you please go to the next slide Getting into the details of what a hard shoreline uh, protection feature can be, that's revetment or seawall. These pictures are taken from the, the Carpinteria region, so you might be familiar with them. These sort of features tend to alter shoreline processes. Um, hard shoreline armoring cuts off the sediment uh, connection between the coast and the, and the land side, and that can be good for stabilizing a shoreline, but it can also have effects of limiting the amount of sand that gets to the beach. So what you end up doing is protecting landward protection uh, or landward development, um, but often uh, eliminating or, or reducing public access and beach access 
habitat. These kinds of structures are common along Southern California, but they're often not constructed, newly constructed these days. They tend to conflict with the, Co the Coastal Act of 1972, and so they can be very difficult to permit in the region. Um, you can compare that to living shorelines on the next slide or soft shoreline protection features. Soft shoreline protection features are living shorelines, sand dunes, uh, winter berms, as you're familiar with, and beach nourishment. These sorts of, sort of features provide uh, public recreational space. They are uh, provide a little bit more of a better view, view shed. Uh, they can also provide habitat. And then most importantly, they can provide protection. Beach nourishment can, can provide a buffer between wave action and development. And <clears throat> they can uh, ebb and flow with the environmental changes of the day compared to a hard shoreline structure, which is uh, very rigid and, and stays in place. Next slide, please. Specifically looking at what a living shoreline is, living shorelines use natural materials and uh, vegetation to provide uh, shoreline stabilization. One example of this is the state beach dunes, which uh, occur, um, exist between the, the sandy beach and the state beach campgrounds. <clears throat> this dune system protects shoreline and landward infrastructure against coastal hazards and sea level rise. And uh, vegetated dunes are becoming a more common adaptation feature for shoreline management uh, throughout the region. Next slide, please. The process that a dune um, goes through to protect your shoreline is first this upper slide, upper picture I mean, uh, shows a cross section of a frontal dune with a high dry beach and, uh, and <clears throat> waves offshore. During a storm, Beaches, as we know, uh, tend to erode, especially during the winter season. Carpinteria's beach may may narrow. That winter sand, that sand gets uh, pulled offshore to an offshore bar during the winter, and it can create scarps, um, <clears throat> which and can create scarps and start to erode your your living shoreline. However, when the conditions change, once the storm passes, on the next slide, the uh, sand dune is is resilient. This is the key to a living shoreline is that it can um, <clears throat> it can kind of build back naturally. So during the summer seasons or during certain types of wave climates, that offshore sandbar then starts to make, make its way back towards the beach. Sandy beaches become wide again, and then wind tends to pick up that sand and blow it inland. If you have a vegetated sand dune, the vegetation can capture wind-blown sand and it deposits on the top of the sand dune and can grow in elevation, and can grow in width, the roots of the vegetation um, start to dive deeper into the sand dune and they provide more stabilization. So although uh, the, the soft shoreline materials may ebb and flow with the winter waves, <clears throat> they can become more resilient and they can build and grow and provide long-term shoreline protection while also providing that habitat that vegetation and natural materials provide and that view shed and public access as well. Next slide, please. One example of a living shoreline in the region is in San Diego. The Cardiff Beach Living Shoreline was re recently constructed in San Diego County. That picture in the top left corner shows a kind of haphazard shoreline protection with scattered riprap. That riprap was reconfigured. It was buried by sand. Um, <clears throat> public access paths were carved through it and vegetation was planted to provide um, a last line of defense protection for uh, Highway 101 here. That was also, that living shoreline was also paired with the beach nourishment event. And beach nourishment paired with living shoreline constructions is very important because if you can buffer waves from the vegetation for a, a good period of time, say a year or two, vegetation can really take hold and really begin to be, become more resilient. Uh, next, please. This project uh, specifically was nationally awarded for uh, it, its ability to bring the area back to what it, the pre-human <clears throat> pre development condition, there used to be a sand dune in this area. That's the natural state of this beach. And this, this project was able to return the area to a natural uh, vegetated sand dune while providing protection, habitat, and access. Next slide, please. Another example that you may be more familiar with uh, in Ventura is the Surface Point project. Surface Point used entirely natural materials from cobble to sand and vegetation. 
And this project was constructed um, <clears throat> before the El Nino winter of 2015, 2016. When that El Nino came through, it really wiped out several beaches in Southern California. And uh, however, the Surfers Point project was, was able to endure and it, it, it survived that winter. And that was a, a testament to what living shoreline projects can do for the coast. So although we, we traditionally engineering um, considered that riprap shorelines, revetments and, and bulk, bulkheads uh, provide the protection needed against an El Nino storm, for instance. If you are, if given the space and the materials and the design, you can also provide the same uh, sort of result with the living shoreline. Next slide, please. Here's a picture from 1929, this aerial of, of Carpinteria, and showing that the living shoreline, the vegetated sand dune existed throughout the whole city uh, back in, in this time period. So before human development came, you can see that sandy line <clears throat> about the edge of, of vegetation along across the middle of the screen here. There's a wide sandy beach and um, the Carpinteria State Park right now, State Beach, is an example of, of how that endures today. So there, there is vegetated sand dune in the area and it, it kind of sets the sets the example for what can be in, in Carpinteria. Next slide, please. The opportunities in Carpinteria are really varied. The shoreline varies dramatically from uh, the, the northwestern side at Sandy Land from revetment to the more developed beach neighborhood area and the state beach area. Um, not one solution will fit all areas but there's a, currently a wide sandy beach with the proper shoreline management and living shoreline design. Um, a, a vegetated sand dune could provide protection for both the inland development, provide, uh, protecting from wave runup, wave erosion <clears throat> and, and flooding. And it can also provide protection of the beach area, providing a reservoir of sand, which can then nourish the beach and maintain public access. Next slide, please. This goes back to Maria. Thank you very much. So I, I'm in downtown Santa Barbara and uh, our power went out all of downtown, which is yeah. why Marie also got kicked out. Welcome back, Erin. Yeah, it, it flickered for, for several of us as well. So <laughs> Great. Um, we're, we're taking a look at the at the guests. It looks like many of it looks like most of the group is back. Um, we have um, a several a range of questions um, that have been posted. Um, and the t conveniently, the power outage aligned well with the end of the presentation. Perfect. Um, I'm going to let you take it away because I am rejoining on my phone. I, we still don't have power here, so I don't Great. have internet connection. No um, problem. But I'll let you take it away on the questions. Terrific. Okay. Great. We had a couple questions related to the uh, the city's winter beach berm program, including curiosities about the effectiveness of the of the berm. So, a question from uh, from George. Um, uh, doesn't the berm that we build each year provide beach nour nourishment and allow for recreational use while protecting beachfront property uh, while protecting the shoreline all at once? And as a follow up from Pete, um, uh, uh, we do a, a berm in the, uh, for this reason in the winter, correct? Storms are typically in the winter. And also notes that we show an El Nino picture from the 1982-1983 El Nino, which is 40 years ago. Um, we've had subsequent El Ninos nearer term, including 2015-2016, uh, and um, and uh, and Pete makes the point that since our beach looks beach beach looks fantastic and healthy by using the berm every winter for 40 years, why has this not been adequate? Um, that's so yeah, specifically about the berm program, um, either for Aaron or Connor, uh, we can talk a little bit about the utility of the berm and uh, what that program is intended to do and how it differs from a living shoreline program. Um, yeah, this is Erin. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll turn on my camera. I'm a little dark over here. Uh, so for our winter burn program, it's intended to be a temporary solution only during winter storm events. Um, that's different from what the living shoreline would the benefits of a living shoreline. A living shoreline would have long-term benefit for sea level rise. So the winter berm, while great for short-term storm events, and it is only for certain heavy storm events. Uh, one storm event could wash the entire thing away. We have had that happen in past years. I know Matt Roberts is on the line and he could probably address that a little better than I can. He's very familiar with that program. 
but um, it's not intended to be a long-term solution to sea level rise. And Connor, if you have anything else to say about that? Sure, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I, I think it, it's a good point. The winter berm does provide good protection and sets a, sets a good precedent for what kind of um, sand elevations or volumes are, are needed to survive certain types of storm events. Um, but as Aaron says, that the dune program is, is looking forward towards sea level rise. And so its goals are a little bit different. And it's not the vegetated sand dune is paired with a shoreline mo uh, management plan. So <clears throat> although it's uh, it, that, that's a big way that it differs from the winter burn, because I, I heard one comment was there was fear of, of losing um, losing beach to the dune, but pairing the dune with a shoreline management plan is intended to maintain a wide beach and a um, back barrier kind of uh, storm protection with, with, the, with the dune system. So there's a lot of work to be done. We'll be modeling uh, storm, certain storm scenarios, um, replicating El Nino's of the past or maybe under sea level rise and looking at how a certain beach design and dune design needs to be, uh, how, how high it needs to be, how wide it needs to be, what materials it should be made of, and what that takes to uh, protect Carpinteria into the future. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Connor. Thanks, Erin. We had a, a follow-up question specifically on on nourishment. Is it is can we call the winter beach berm nourishment? Does it does it become a nourishment event, or um, is it really a structure that erodes and is washed washed away and does not actually result in in nourishment year to year? Um, I can take that one. Uh, it depends on the year. Uh, during years where we don't have heavy storm events and high tides that wash the berm away, it can be a temporary nourishment. Um, again, that is only temporary. It only lasts while it's right there on the beach. And then as that, as we, we have wave action, that sand actually gets washed downstream through what's called the river of sand through long storage longshore transport. Um, so it can be a very temporary nourishment measure, um, but that's only if we don't have heavy storms during that year. Great. Terrific. Oh, we had a, a question from, uh, from Roland. How would the vegetative shoreline protection blend with the winter, uh, winter beach berm program? I think it is actually intended to, sorry, I'm trying to find a spot where you guys can see me. Um, it's actually intended to replace that. So the intention is, is that should we have a living shoreline, we wouldn't have to do a berm every year. Instead, we would be focused more on beach nourishment as a long-term goal. Great. Um, uh, John, uh, John Callender had a question, and we may have answered this all, all already, but just want to make sure if there's any nuances. Uh, John says, it sounds like the project being described would involve creating a permanent berm south of the current development along Sandyland Road in the current winter beach berm, and at the current winter beach berm leaves uh, little to no sandy beach at high tide. Wouldn't making that berm permanent cause a loss of public access and sandy shoreline habitat? I can, I can I can start that off, and Connor, maybe you could talk about this a little bit as well. Um, sure. Right. Um, of course, the goal of the project is to balance um, shoreline protection with public access and resource conservation. One of the the benefits and the outcomes of a living shoreline project is the installation of of habitat and the improvement of public access, the long term permanent improvement of public access. Um, harkening back to the um, the photos we showed of the Cardiff Beach example, um, public access was actually improved with with more with defined corridors, defined um, entry points, and uh, to allow the public easier access to the shoreline. In in uh, prior to the shoreline um, or the the Living Shoreline project, the revetments and the riprap was actually a, a barrier to access, and so that's the it's a multifaceted goal. Um, it, with the installation of a living shoreline. And those two uh, two aspects are incredibly important to the overall outcome. Do you have anything to add to that, Connor, from, you know, specifically on, on design? Yeah, thanks, Erica. That was, that was 
pretty comprehensive. And I'll just add that, yes, the, the dune and the and the berm, they have their similarities, but the berm is a, a bit more of a crude um, mm -hmm. construction for, for a very singular purpose, whereas the dune has as many objectives and which will all be a part of its, its more nuanced design and being paired with a, a shoreline management project. Um, mm -hmm. The goal is to create a wide beach and maintain that wide sandy beach and public access as long as possible. Right, right. One other reminder on that is that looking at the different stretches along the beach, uh, Connor made this made this observation that conditions vary widely depending on what's there currently, how how wide the beach is, elevations, beach profiles, and so it, as this is the very beginning of this of this endeavor of this study. That's one of the first aspects is is identifying the existing conditions along the shoreline in, in Carpinteria and crafting unique um, uh, um, solutions and a unique design, unique unique uh, living shoreline design that would fit right in different segments. There's not a one size fits all solution for a living shoreline. It's adaptive to the conditions that are on the ground right now and also in response to uh, to coastal conditions, which will be modeled as part of this project. Okay, great. Um, Scott had a question. Will there be a contingency for back-to-back -back storms of increasing intensity? So, you know, something that would subject the living shoreline to, you know, storm after storm. Um, how, how, Connor, you may have some information about that, about how living shorelines respond to really relatively intense storm um, seasons. Sure, thanks. That is a good question. It's unpredictable what the winter seasons can bring, but we, we do have information about what has happened in the past and what projections might be coming in the future. So um, those kinds of worst case scenarios, we will be modeling them and, and trying to determine what what might overcome the uh, the dune and what, what would it take to, to erode the dune, to overtop the dune. And in those cases, what kind of uh, short-term adaptive management techniques can we use to restore it? to continue to protect the city? And what can we do in the long term to, to provide pr protection in case this were to happen again? Mm -hmm. Right, great, thank you. Um, Pete has a, a point that in the 2015-2016 storm year, which was an El Nino year, we saw up and down the coast in that season, some is just unprecedented erosion. Um, and Carpinteria was, um, was, was not spared. Um, that, but the berm did it, did its job. That it did what it was supposed to do um, with successive, successive um, uh, attacks from from uh, the storm season. Um, Aaron, you may recall, was there was there anything that was needed during the storm season to maintain the berm, or was it kind of a one time installation in that season and it, it withheld it withstood the storm season for the whole year, or was the city um, out there doing maintenance? Just out of curiosity. Um, I'm actually going to defer to Matt Roberts if he's still on because he's the one that was managing that project. Matt, are you still with us? Hi, I'm here. Okay. Oh. Hi, Matt. Hello. I was multitasking, so <laughs> was, was there a question I could help with? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, Matt, we had a, had a, a, a point about um, the 2015 Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Erica. Oh, okay. Thanks, Erin. <laughs> no problem. Sorry that we were talking over each other. Um, uh, we had a, a, a point made about the 2015-2016 storm year, which was that El Nino season that just, you know, put all the coastal communities, including the parks and the shorelines, uh, in, in jeopardy. Um, and uh, the notice that the, the Winter Beach Berm program worked, that it did its job. Do you have, do you recall from that season um, you know, any, any the performance of the beach berm? Did it require maintenance? Was the city out there, you know, daily doing anything, or was it really just a one-time, uh, you know, construction and it withstood that storm season? Well, I think the 2015-16 season was not that remarkable. The berm, uh, as I recall, didn't require any significant maintenance of any at all, mm -hmm. and that's often the case. If it's a perfect year for the winter berm, we build it on time and we have adequate beach sand to do it and half of it is eroded by the time spring hits. So we only have to pay for half of its uh, leveling. During the drought, when we've had an absence of large storms, we've built the berm and um, it has not been needed. Mm -hmm. However, I can remember many, many years when the berm had to be, real, be, be rebuilt several times in the winter. In mm -hmm. fact, some days the storms were so uh, big and had such a duration 
that we, we would rebuild it literally at every low tide for a week. So those are the most severe years. Those are things like 1983, 1988 or 9, 19, um, I want to say 96 or 7. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that really stand out is um, why some action needs to be taken. Okay, great. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, terrific. Um, we have a, another uh, comment from Scott. Uh, also, if you start to consider the middle solutions, will you include consideration of hard surfaces that can encourage sea life? That might be a question for Connor as far as how, how this uh, soft solution like a living shoreline relates to some um, uh, you know, hybrid solution with, a, with harder structures, especially if it relates to um, you know, reefs and um, in-water work. Yeah, in, yeah, that's a good question. And in-water work for, I think, uh, in the case of Cardiff Beach is, is not, did not occur. That was more of a buried revetment. So that rock in, in, only during an eroded condition would become exposed. Um, but I think in-water work could occur if a uh, sand retention device were, were to be employed in the city. That could be an offshore breakwater, uh, near offshore reef system, or a groin system, which projects out into the uh, <clears throat> near shore area, and those would all be part of the shoreline management plan mm -hmm. if they were if they were implemented. Those sorts of um, projects can promote habitat in certain cases. There are certain materials out there, such as e-concrete, these uh, concrete materials which are modified to promote the, um, the latching on of, of organisms like oysters and so forth, or they could promote the uh, establishment of kelp beds and, and that sort. So that that opportunity is there, and, and I think we will be thinking about that. Great, thank you very much. Um, we had a question from from Mark. Um, also, what is the history of Santa Barbara County flood control sediment deposition um, in terms of frequency and volumes over the past 40 years during the berm program? And what contribution have these efforts provided to shoreline protection? Um, it, you'll recall from the presentation, and Aaron, I may, I may um, turn to you for any specifics, but um, that's absolutely right. The, the Santa Barbara County Flood Control Program maintains and uh, empties the, uh, the, the debris basins. Um, we had a, a photo in the presentation showing that deposition of sediment. And, um, and, uh, and so that's something that has been ongoing and it varies year to year. The, uh, the volumes are driven by rainfall. So the amount of sediment that is captured in the basin is directly dependent on how much uh, sediment comes down the, from the mountains. Um, in response to, uh, to rainfall events. So over the drought, the amount of deposition was quite low. And we saw that in Carpinteria, but then also up and down the South Coast where uh, natural sedimentation then also mechanical uh, deposition from uh, the flood control program was generally low and uh, beaches got narrower. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, without an input of that sediment, you can start to see that changing in the beach with the return of more normal storm systems, we're already starting to see the beach widths increase, the amount of sediment uh, kind of naturally flow onto the beaches, and then also increased uh, deposition from the flood control program from emptying the, de the debris basin. So that, that volume changes depending on those conditions and will continue to do so in the future. That being said, um, the flood control program is an excellent source of sediment. So in the case of needing sediment to do beach nourishment, um, that's that's an existing program, that sediment's available, and Carpinteria at Ash Avenue is an approved deposition site and has been so for a long time. So it overlaps with our project area and, and would continue to, to uh, be uh, considered as part of this program. Um, it's kind of an overview. Aaron, do you have anything to add related to that and, and the city's relationship with, the, with that program? Um, yeah, I do. So that program, there's two ways to look at that. So there's the county flood control does their maintenance on the debris basins, and that is a good source of sediment for our beaches. Um, that's sediment that would be ending up within our system under normal circumstances if the debris basins weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, there are some programmatic things that could improve to uh, mitigate the impacts to the local community, such as transport through the community. There's also the sediment um, work that the county flood control does in the Carpentry Assault Marsh. Um, they do some dredging through there. That's more fine sediment. It doesn't 
provide as much nourishment to our beaches, um, but they do have, that is at the end of that system there. And so that comes out of the mouth of the salt marsh. Um, I know we saw really heavy sediment deposition from the county flood control after the 2018 events. Um, that is something that was done under emergency circumstances. It wasn't like a long-term programmatic thing. Um, we are working with county flood control to come up with a solution that would work for both agencies uh, without having a heavy impact on residents rate in that area. Um, I would say that ultimately we would like to have that sediment deposited on our beaches because it is very beneficial to our local community. Um, as I said, it, without the debris basins being there, it would be deposited there anyway. Things like debris basins and dams as they are constructed reduce the amount of sediments that come to our beaches, which is one of the causes of erosion. So. Great. Great. Hopefully that, that's helpful information to answer that question. Um, we also had a couple of questions um, or just comments about nourishment and, and hopefully we clarified that as well, that the, that the winter berm program is not a nourishment program per se. It brings sand to the beach, but is not intended to be a nourishment program because it erodes and you know is intended for protection. So th thank you for that comment. Um, great. We have a, qu a question from Pete. How did the proposed dunes stop the sea level from rising? If the berm is to be eliminated eventually, how do the smaller proposed dunes protect property as well as uh, the beach versus the very significantly high berm? Seems that eliminating the berm at any point can put properties at risk. I think maybe Connor, you can talk about you know the the details on that, but essentially it's about beach width and the composition of different materials within the width that you have to work with on the beach. Um, as we just mentioned, a berm is not nourishment; it's not intended to be a permanent, spread out, uh, distributed. Um, source of sand that is intended to stay for a while, but by increasing the beach width and the beach profile, that's where you get the protection from the coast and um, and it, you know adjusting that profile in response to projected sea level rise is the science behind the design and creating a design that is resilient to the effects of coast of coastal um, uh, uh, wave run up and other effects, coastal flooding. Uh, as sea level rise progresses, you may have some more information um, specifically on the the behind on the, the behind the scenes for that, Connor. But that's that's the idea is about beach width and, and the profile. Yeah, thanks, Erica. I, I totally agree. It is a beach width is a key factor to uh, protecting the city. It pr provides a buffer between wave wave action and the development. Um, the living shoreline provides more of a uh, last line of defense. It's uh, <clears throat> higher in elevation than the beach would be. It's wider. It also provides a reservoir of sand should a beach beach be eroded. There is a, that back, back beach um, volume of sand that can then uh, continue to buffer the waves. So there's all, and sorry, just, uh, just thinking here, materials within the dune will also play a component as to how effective it is at protecting compared to the winter berm. Um, we could opt to design the use of cobble material, which may be, uh, which is less easily moved by waves and, and can kind of hold its position more. It can steep in a little bit. It can reflect wave energy, absorb wave energy a bit better. And so little details like that might uh, in the long run um, play a big role in, in providing more protection than the winter berm does. <clears throat> right. Thanks, Connor. Um, as a follow on, um, conveniently, Roland brings up that the the debris flow uh, that Aaron mentioned the, the, in 2018 has extended the beach in a positive way, bringing more sediment to, to the beach, to the shoreline. And the question is, are we imagining a wide dune or a high one? As an owner of one of the beach houses, I'm interested in saving our beach, but also maintaining a view. What do you see as an effective dune? That's and that's a great comment, Roland, because it's exactly as we were discussing that balance between access, views, uh, uh, habitat value, and shoreline protection. That's what this project is all about. Um, Tony, you may want to talk about that specifically as far as that trade-off between height and length and distance. Um, all of those factors will matter and are are um, are going to be taken into consideration in the design. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that. But. Yeah, thanks. It's a really great point. Um, 
do, do, is it a high dune or a wide dune? And the answer is that it will vary because the conditions in Carpinteria vary. Uh, certain view sheds were aware that, that that's definitely a um, component of, that the city wants to maintain to the best that they can and the public access as well. There is this one reference that we'll be using, it won't be you know, a deciding factor, but it's called the FEMA 540 rule. And that's for dune construction, typically on the East Coast. But if you can have about 540 cubic yards of material per linear foot of beach, um, then that's considered, your dune is considered large enough to protect the shoreline. And they don't direct how that 540 cubic yards is distributed. It could be a wide dune. It could be a tall dune. As long as the volume of material is there, then you're likely to, to have a, a similar amount of protection. Now, we'll confirm ideas like that with our, our own modeling. Um, but there is going to be a variation between height and width and, and materials to account for the variations across the city. Great. Thanks, Connor. Great. Um, Michelle has a question. What do you recommend as the optimum type of plants which should be planted to flourish and thrive in the sandy soil of a living shoreline? That's a good question. And maybe you, you, um, Dave or Connor, you may have a, an idea of that palette. Um, but it's a familiar palette <laughs> for, for Carpinteria. <laughs> yeah, if Dave is available, I'd love to have him comment. He's an eco ecological specialist and expert here. Restoration specialist. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Hubbard, and uh, I've been doing these projects all around Southern California, and we have a very set palette of native plants that we use that don't need any irrigation and thrive. They can even grow in seawater. <clears throat> so it's red sand verbena, um, it's beach burr, and uh, beach evening primrose, and beach salt bush in the front lines of the dunes. And depending on how much width Connor can give me with his engineering design, then we'll add a whole bunch of other nice flowering plants in the stable dunes. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Great. Um, Andrea make, makes a, a point that Linden Field was flooded, as was Ash Avenue, Linden, and maybe Holly. And I, I believe, Andrea, you're referring during El Nino seasons. I think that comment came in when we were discussing um, past conditions that brought brought flood, flooding to the, the city. Um, and that's true. And those are some of the conditions that, that we know about from the past. And in the sea level at, at sea level rise adaptation plan were identified as uh, continuing and, and in some places being exacerbated by sea level rise in the future. Um, Marie mentioned that confluence of fluvial, which is creek-based flooding, you know, when the creeks spill their banks, and then uh, that confluence with coastal flooding, that can create some of the more significant um, spillovers and, and, and areas of flooding in the low-lying areas of the city. So that's, that's those are the exact areas that um, the, the study was planning for, and this is one tool to address a very specific location where um, flooding is known currently and is expected to get worse in the future. And so this is one, one tool, tool in the box <laughs> that, that we're looking at. And George has a question. Um, sorry to step away. Don't worry. That's OK. Um, what, uh, with what we may be coming in terms of beach preservation, will any sand dunes be allowed to get so high as to block um, the view of beachfront property? Um, we we talked we talked about that just to, uh, you know in context of another comment and um, understand the concern that if the uh, if the if the proposal is a high dune that the there would be trade offs you know not in terms of public access but then also views from beachfront properties if the berm comes up and actually blocks a, a view from a deck or a, a patio or a window um, that's something that is. Uh, that you know we we've heard and we understand is a concern in in, um, in the city and is will be factored into the overall considerations and options. Um, as a reminder of the scope of this project, this is a, a feasibility study, and so uh, we're looking at a combination of not just design and technical solutions, but then also workable real world solutions and presenting those as options um, and exploring those trade offs. So. I would encourage, um, you know, th that this is going to be number one. We encourage everybody to stay engaged because this is one aspect, one trade-off that we want to make sure is accounted for. And when we come back with the uh, results of the feasibility study and the range of options, and you know what we could do here, what we could do here, um, that's where we can really start to get down to brass tacks about what's feasible in different extents. At this point, we're not sure, but we know it's a concern and it's something we want to avoid. 
Great. Um, terrific, Andrea. I, I, this is a follow up on the on the plants. Andrea mentions uh, creeping ryegrass, sand verbena, dune evening primrose, uh, dandelions, and and more um, as as a, as plants to consider. So thank you for that. Um, Charles brings up that the Ocean Protection Council's recommended high sea level rise projection is more like 6.6 .6 feet for 2100, and and most recently they have promulgated resilience guidance to assume 3.5 in 2050 and 7.6 in 2100. Um, and the question is, and that's that's true, um, there's, there's a range of sea level rise models out there and the science is evolving. At the time the Carpinteria Sea Level Rise Adaptation Plan was prepared, um, the best available science was, was input in the models. And while that was going on, there's also other models going out there. And so the um, reasonable worst case that was employed is a, um, is a is 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 a is like I said, a reasonable worst case, but also acknowledges that the, that it's a, a midpoint on a range that is evolving with new science. So thanks for pointing that out, Chester uh, Lester, that um, that the uh, that that there's some some ranges in there, and we acknowledge that. And the question is, will you be modeling the implications of these higher scenarios for the design and functioning of the project? Um, and the, the short answer is yes. So we have the model that was used for the sea level rise um, study, but with new science, we wanna make sure that we're, we're being informed and making uh, planning and uh, design uh, recommendations based on the latest science. And so those will certainly be incorporated and considered in the overall study. Um, using the sea level rise adaptation plan as a basis, and then you know incorporating and understanding what those new projections are. Um, so that we are being responsive and, and forecasting accurately. Great, so um, Scott asks, are there alternative deposit sites being considered when the sediment is not appropriate for the beach environment or public health? And I believe that's related to uh, you know, to the the, uh, the deposition of um, uh, flood control sediments. Yeah. And I can address that. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, yes, there are alternative uh, de deposition sites. Um, they Some of it goes to construction companies. Some of it gets hauled to quarries many miles away. Uh, there are negatives to that as well, uh, including the, the long transportation routes that they typically have to take. Um, but over the years, that has been the case, is that a lot of this material actually leaves our system entirely. Uh, that is one of the reasons that we've seen some issues on our beaches, and our beaches have gotten smaller than they used to be, um, because when that sediment leaves the system entirely, it does not have any benefit to our local shorelines. Um, and then it gets used for other things at um you know, for construction projects and stuff like that. But we would prefer that the better sediments, um, you know, and that comes down to certain grain sizes and uh, sizes of rocks and stuff like that do get deposited on our beaches. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Great. Terrific, right. Uh, um, I guess just one thing to add on to that, um, as as far as the, the flood control deposition program goes, um, that's one thing that happens is is testing. So Aaron mentioned grain size, uh, composition, um, also contamination. So making sure that the sediments that are being deposited on the beach don't have sediments that would contribute to water quality concerns or public health concerns. And so that's something that's built into the existing program um, and will continue into the future. Great. Um, we have a question from George. Um, if there is no berm, what has the projection been for property protection? The berm has arguably, arguably been a great success for that purpose. Are we saying the dunes will be as, as effective? And I, I think the short answer is the goal is, is yes. You know, I think ultimately the in the big picture, the project wouldn't be feasible if it doesn't afford shoreline protection. That's one of the main goals is that the living shoreline would be designed and maintained in a way that would first offer shoreline protection for ne currently and then into the future, um, given uh, sea level rise scenarios that are being projected. Uh, I think that's the short answer. Um, Connor, Aaron, anything to add on, on that? Sure. Yeah, I can. I can say that 
I agree with you, Erica. Um, it is definitely a goal to at least maintain the level of protection that the city sees now, but I think we are really hoping to provide protection um, looking forward a few decades. Uh, the, the city created a, a plan of adapting to sea level rise in their sea level rise vulnerability assessment and this living shoreline program along with the shore, shoreline management, potential beach nourishment or sand retention or, or other techniques like those uh, are hoping to, I think, um, protect the city out through maybe, oh, I shouldn't give a, an exact number because I don't know exactly, but but several decades out would be would be a good goal for us currently. Right, right. Great. And I Great. should clarify that, you know, these, these protection measures, they do not stop sea level rise, but they do offer levels of protection for our community from that, those effects. Right, that's a good clarification, right? Sea level rise will proceed the way that it does. And um, as a commenter mentioned that uh, projections are changing all the time. You know, that's something that is that is part of, of this is that um, it's an emerging science, it's, a, it's an emerging modeling, and um, we're being responsive to the best that's available, um, but that'll proceed the way that it will. And this is one tool that is intended to um, afford protection and a, and a long-term solution as opposed to the year-to-year -year, um, maintenance and costs that go along with, with maintaining the beach berm. So um, it's an alternate, but it's a long-term strategy that should be self-sustaining and require a maintenance program that, is, that differs from the winter beach berm as well. Great. And that's actually the last written comment that we had. Are there any other questions, comments? Um, you could either, oh, we have one more from Jenny Dugan. Um, a long-term dune could reduce the impacts to the beach biota over time compared to a temporary berm. That's a great point, Jenny. Thank you. Terrific. Um, all right. Well, um, any any last comments? You can either uh, type in a comment, or if anybody would like to raise a hand, we could um, take any final thoughts. <laughs> okay. Great question. Um, George asked, "Will there be additional meetings like this?" And the answer is yes, absolutely. This is the first meeting um, of the project, so it's very early. Um, there, you know, with some feedback and some discussion that we had today, we'll embark on the next step, which is actually getting into establishing the existing setting and uh, starting to work on the feasibility of different options. And um, so stand by for notification about um, future opportunities to join a meeting, maybe in person next time. <laughs> Thank you for everyone accommodating the, the, the online workshop. Um, and at that point, we'll be able to report back on some initial findings, um, some of those initial options. Um, so we'll have we'll have lots to talk about. There'll be other opportunities to take some feedback and some comments and answer questions. So um, yeah, we'll be happy to notify. Yeah, and I just want to follow up with that. Um, this is Aaron again. Uh, if you did not RSVP to this website, the, this particular um, meeting, which is fine, you know, we included all of our materials, but, but if you would like to be notified, if you want to send your contact information to me and I can add you to our list. Also, Anything, any upcoming announcements, meetings, progress reports, we will be posting all of that stuff on the web page for this project, which um, is how you all got, were linked to this meeting. Um, so feel free to check back there regularly for updates. But again, if you would like to be on our list uh, for notification, feel free to send me an email. Uh, my contact information was included with the presentation. Uh, it's on the website and I will add you to that contact list. And if you have follow-up questions after this, go ahead and,